So those are not just random acts of kindness in that little bumper. That's a Christ follower doing what Christ followers do and being contagious. You realize as a Christ follower, you're contagious. Actually, let me just drop back. You're contagious, period. What are you infecting people with? Some of us love to infect people with bitterness and anger and resentment and hatred. While others want to infect people with sweetness and all this goodness and all that, which is not bad. Still others want to infect people with the gospel virus. So you're, listen, you're contagious. Well, whoever you're around, you're contagious. You know, we've, had, we've got two people here today who aren't touching hands. And they, they won't hold hands. They won't do anything. They won't, you won't shake a hand. They give you the fist bump or the old, you know, the, the old uh, 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 young Frankenstein, you know, elbow bump. Because they're, they're, they don't want to be contagious. They don't want to rub their germs off on you. But we want to talk today, and we're in our series about uh, outbreak. And outbreak is not only the name of our church. Outbreak is what we want to start and so, uh, or, or help, help foster. The outbreak started years ago, 2000 to be exact. But today we want to focus mainly on being contagious. And if you think about it, who is Outbreak Church? Outbreak Church is a multi-ethnic church that is courageous, contagious, and intent on infecting the world with the gospel of grace. Now, those words were not something that we just went down to, you know, to the chicken shack and ate up a bunch of wings and stuff and thought, oh, those are good words, let's put them in there. No, those words are prayed over. Those words are anointed. Those words are, are words that came out of hours and hours of prayer because that's who we want to be. We want to be multi-ethnic. We want to be courageous and contagious and intentional. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're, like I said, we're in our second week of this series called Outbreak. And during this series, my hope is that you'll be empowered to live out what Christ has called you to do. That is, be contagious. There's no question. If you look at Scripture, Jesus said you've got to be contagious. Period. Right? So Christianity is not just, um, it's not just something that we that we kind of ascribe to. Christianity is contagious. And you are the carriers. You are the sneezers. Okay? You're the ones who are supposed to sneeze on. That's why at the end of every service I say, sneeze Jesus on somebody. Because I want you to do that. Seriously. I really want you to do that. And usually the word epidemic or pandemic or virus, all that's usually used in a negative context. But we're looking at it in a totally positive complex con context. Like the the outbreak of the gospel virus, the, ep uh, the gospel epidemic, the gospel epidemic, epidemic of grace. Now, let me ask you this. In, in the Bible, um, there's a scripture that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? Okay. What part of all is not all? <laughs> we pick and choose that all, don't we? You know, I can do this through Christ who strengthens me, but God forbid, don't ask me to do that through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> you know? So we pick and choose on that. But let me ask you this. All is all, right? Okay? So, if we have been given all, if we have been given everything that we need to start an epidemic of grace... All right? And if we have been completely equipped to fulfill what, what uh, we in the church call the Great Commission, we'll talk about that in just a minute. We've got everything. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Then why do we keep the gospel virus quarantined inside these four walls? I'm just asking. You know, I'm just asking. Look at your... your uh, Notes there. It's a line at the top that I really want you to pay attention to. Let's read this together. The gospel isn't something we come to church to hear. It's something we go from church to spread. Quit coming in here to be fed. You know, I, now I love to eat. Y'all know that. You know, last Sunday you couldn't see, but under my shirt was my t-shirt that said, feed me barbecue and had a big pig on it. You know? So I love to eat. 
But what, what's going to happen if I just eat and get fed and get fed and get fed and never go out and work it out? I'm going to be an obese fat guy, aren't I? I'm going to be one of those guys that's on TV. Okay? I'm going to be the 600-pound pastor. Right. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> yeah, you do, man. Thank you very much. So I'm going to be the 600-pound, you know, pastor. Here's the thing, though. Many, many, 99.99% people say, well, I'm going to church to get fed. I'm going to get fed. I'm going to get fed. Or I'm just not getting fed here. I'm going to get fed. What? And all they do is get fed, 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 fed. And church ain't nothing but a bunch of 600-pound Christians doing nothing. But getting fat on the Word of God, but never working it out. Our text today says, work it out. There's a song in there somewhere. Bow, 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 bow. Work it out. Ow. Okay. Uh, but... So that's what I want. So, and, and please understand this. The gospel isn't something we come to church to hear. It's something we go from church to spread. This is just the huddle, okay? The game is out there. The game's out there. So this is, this is where we need to be spreading the gospel. And this point was very much on Jesus' mind when he uh, was beginning his, his uh, ministry. And he was up on the side of a mountain and he preached a, a big sermon, the longest sermon he ever preached, and that we call it the Sermon on the Mount. And, and in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus compared his bride or Christ's followers, as us, okay, he compared us to a bowl of salt, or light on a on a stand, All right? And and in Matthew five, if you want to turn there, um, your Bibles, or some of you want to turn your Bibles on and scroll down to it, or open your hard copy Bible. Uh, remember, the Bible's divided into two sections: Old Testament's to the left, New Testament's to the right. Matthew's the first book of the New Testament, and we're in chapter five, and this is the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to look at verse thirteen, starting uh, thirteen through sixteen, I believe. So it'll be up on the screen, and I'll be reading it to you. I'm reading from the Christian Standard uh, Edition. You are the salt of the earth. Now, who's the salt of the earth? We are. We are. Right. We are. Jesus didn't say they are the salt of the earth. He said you are the salt of the earth. Who was he talking to? His disciples and his followers. Okay. Okay, you are the salt of the earth. Ooh, but if salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Whew. That's strong words. Okay, some people try to tell you, well, Jesus had this great sense of humor and he was using allegory. No, he was laying it out. He was shooting straight. He wasn't pulling no punches. Okay. Then going on down to verse 14. You are the light of the world. Who's the light of the world? We are. Right. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and, gives, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father in heaven. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your text, Lord. Thank you for your word, Lord Jesus. Thank you that we are the salt of the earth and you've called us to be the light of the world. Lord, forgive us, Lord, when we turn into pepper and darkness. Amen. So in these, in these passages here, Jesus is talking about infecting the world. You realize he has just started his, his ministry. And he's got... Not even 12 guys at this point, I don't even think. He's got, got most of them. And he's saying, we, guys, we've got to kickstart this thing. We've got to get it going. And he didn't have the opportunity to go on Facebook and do a Kickstarter campaign. You know. He kickstarted with people. And that's the way it has happened for 2,000 plus years. And that's the way it happens with us. You do realize that we are his only option here of spreading the word. Yeah, the rocks cry out if we don't. Yeah? 
And listen, I ain't going to tell you, thank you, Nathan. I don't want no rock crying out for me. I want to be doing the shouting. I want to be doing the shouting. So he's saying, Jesus is saying, this is the way you infect the world. Uh, you got to be salt in a tasteless world. You got to be light in a dark and hopeless world. And, and as a Christ follower, Jesus is saying, as a Christ follower, you've got to be salt and you've got to be light and you've got to have a sneeze that's infectious and you've got, to, you've got to sneeze that on people. All right? Last week we talked about Paul, how infectious his sneeze was. Remember, he was in jail, chained to somebody, uh, and they rotate every four hours. And it says, every single person in the jail heard the gospel. That's crazy. That's crazy. He was infectious. He had a sneeze that went everywhere. No, if, he was in the, if he was in jail or wherever. And, and we, we liken that to that's actually the sneeze of evangelism. That's how evangelism spreads is you just sneeze it on people. Okay? Just like this girl in this thing we were talking about. She was not doing random acts of kindness. She was being Jesus to people. All right? And there's more to that than we're going to talk about. But I want you to think about this with me just a second. When somebody sneezes, I mean, now let me say this. I did hear a person sneeze the other day, and they went, Meep. and I thought, my Lord, that ain't, even, that ain't even a sneeze. You know, I thought, how did you even do that? What good did that do? You know, but I want you to look at this slide here. Oh, yes. That's a sneeze. Now, that stuff, and you know what it is, coming out of his mouth and his nose, you realize it's traveling at 100 miles an hour? Mm -hmm. Remember I told you about in that movie, where we, about in the Outbreak movie, how the guy sneezes in the movie theater, and, and it's, you see it going into other guys, a guy laughing down here, it goes in his mouth. <laughs> Gross. Guys, listen, think about this with me just a second. If you're a Jesus sneezer, Every one of those is a gospel droplet. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, can I go? I guess I ought to go a different direction, huh? Okay. Forget that analogy. <laughs> Somebody would say, Pastor Scott, talk about gospel snot today. <laughs> no, I'm not. Okay, all right. All right, anyway. Anyway, this picture proves my point, and thank you. Y'all are proving my point, too. There's three, there's three elements to a sneeze. They are big, a real sneeze. I'm not talking about that little sissy sneeze I heard the other day. Okay, I'm talking about a real sneeze. They're big, they're wet, and they're loud. All right? So let's look at big first of all. They're big, um, and in the sense that, that that is the main focus of Christianity throughout the New Testament is sneezing Jesus on people. They're big. Okay, they're big. And, and I want you to understand this. The call to sneeze is not optional. Jesus didn't say, well, you can sneeze if you get a little devil pepper up your nose. No, he said, you sneeze, period. Okay? The, the call for us to sneeze the gospel on people is a permanent mandate from Jesus himself. He's the one that told us that. All right? And there's just several verses I pulled out of the air here that I just thought were just perfect illustrations. Uh, Acts 1.8 tells us that you've got to be his witnesses wherever you are, and you're empowered to reach people far and near. Look what it says. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses. Another, every time you hear witnesses, I want you to think sneezers. You will be my sneezers in Jerusalem and Judea and to the ends of the earth. All right? Now, there's a whole other sermon in why he specifically laid out that geographic pattern, but we'll talk about that at another time. All right? 2 Corinthians 5.19, and this is awesome. We sneeze on people because we have been reconciled with God through Christ. In other words, we have been infected with the gospel virus, and we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, the ministry of infection to hopeless people all around us with the gospel. And if you don't see hopeless people around you, folks, you're in the wrong spot. Amen. You're in the wrong place. 
Look at verse uh, 2 Corinthians 5.19. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and He has committed the message of reconciliation to us. And then Jesus Himself goes over in Matthew 28 and 19 and 20. He says, look, man, you got to go into the whole world. You got to spread the gospel message. You got to lead people to Jesus. You got to baptize them. You got to build them up in the faith. Speaking of baptism, we've got a lot of folks who are waiting on baptism. And, and I'm, I'm happy to say that, that after we move in the new building, we'll be having a baptism about three weeks after we move in there. So that's going to be exciting. So uh, we'll be lining those, we'll be contacting you folks about that. But this is called the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, 20. Listen, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now, what did he say? Did he say stay? No. Why is it that we modern church have turned us into hide inside the church and make disciples? Like my daughter says, that's just wrong. That's just wrong. Okay? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So listen, You've heard this before, but it's, it's well worth repeating right here. Jesus gave us the great commission, not the good suggestion. He didn't say, you know, if you like, if you feel like it, if you come home from camp and you're all jazzed up, or if you hear a sermon, you're like, you know, whatever, you know, that's all good. Just go do it then. No. He said, you do it all the time. Go. And that go literally means as you are going. In other words, Every step you take, whether you're at work, at QT, at the barbecue place, getting your hair cut, whatever, you should be sneezing Jesus on people. You should. So let's get back to this salt analogy here right quick. Jesus said in, in verse 13, Matthew 5, he said, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, one thing you have to understand, Jesus is a master at, at tying in cultural stuff with his speaking. Jesus knows in, in his day, salt was so much more valuable than it is for us. We just go get that thing off the shelf and you get a big old, you know, round cardboard thing and it's just, it, you know, it's just nothing. But back in Jesus' day, it was very expensive. It was hard to get. It was expensive. In fact, did you realize that we get our word salary from the Greek word salt? Because they used it so many times to pay people with salt. You got paid with salt. That's a great idea. I'm glad they don't do that no more. But... Um, but here's the point. Jesus understood the value of salt. He, he knew what it, was, what it was like. And <coughs> excuse me, I want you to think about this with me just a second. For salt to have any impact at all, it's got to be potent. Now, this is some salt I have brought from the house. Cindy's nice little, um, uh, what do you call that salt shaker? Uh, cut glass salt shaker. Okay, and this is salt. All right, now have any of you ever? I, I picked up some salt the other day at a restaurant, and it like didn't even come out of the salt shaker. Y'all been there? You know, it was just like crusted over, and it, and she said, "Well, just shake it real hard." I'm like, "I'm gonna throw it real hard," and uh, so it didn't. Even, it, it was so bad it didn't even come out when I took the top off and tried to dump it out. It was like cement in there. Okay, that is salt that has lost its saltiness. Now think about this. When salt has lost its saltiness, all it wants to do is stick around other salts. Bam! <laughs> Somebody needs to tweet that. I mean, Lord have mercy. <laughs> when we've lost our saltiness, all we want to do is get around other salts. <laughs> Let me just get around some salts and I'll be good. Don't shake me out of my shaker. Uh -uh. Mm -mm. Listen. God wants to shake you up. Shake, shake. No, that was your booty. That was KC and the Sunshine Band. So I, I started to say, shake, 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 shake your salt shaker. But anyway. So anyway, who knows? Where am I? So it's got to be, it's got to be decent salt. All right? It's got to be decent salt. And then the second thing, for salt to have any impact at all, it's got to be put on something. It's got to be put. Let me, let me give an example. I didn't eat breakfast this morning. But I did bring some 
chicken tenders left over from the house. Now, they're pretty good. But you know what? They ain't near salty enough. That's it. Mm. They are good. And they're going to stay right there because I'm going to munch on them the rest of the time. Then you can skip lunch. No. <laughs> That's my breakfast. What you talking about, huh? Okay. I got a salt shaker. I got my food that needs some salt on it. There's the shaker. Come on, do it. What has to happen for that salt to make a difference on that chicken? What has to happen? <clears throat> After I drink my drink. <clears throat> what has to happen for us as salt to make a difference out there? We got we got to be poured out, right? We got to be poured out. This salt shaker is no good to anybody if it just stays in there. If it just stays in there, it's going to turn like that one in that restaurant I went to the other day. Guys, we are no good. And I'm just going to tell you, we as Christians are no good to the kingdom if all we do is sit in church. If we don't go, if we don't shake ourselves on the people around us, we have got to be, we have got to be potent. In other words, we've got to have the gospel in us. Remember, I've, I, we say this all the time. You can't infect somebody with something you ain't got. And if you're not infecting them with the gospel, you're infecting them with something else. And I don't even want to know what that is. So we're going to infect them with the gospel. So we've got to be potent enough for that. And then we've got to be close enough to, to have an impact. So we've got to be potent and we've got to have proximity. That's a big word that means you've got to be close. All right. Second thing. Not only they're big, but they're wet. Evangelistic sneezes are big and they are wet. And they are wet in, the, in the, the, the context of the fact that we have got to be saturated and soaked with the gospel virus ourselves before we can sneeze it out. We've got to be. And you've got to be close enough to people to sneeze on them. You've got to be. And that's exactly what we, we got. We got to have high potency. All right. High potency is the word there. And if we're going to have high potency, just like I said, that means we got to have a strong enough concentration of Jesus in us and his influence on our lives so that we'll actually rub it off and sneeze it and infect other people with it. Now, when it comes to getting high potency, a lot of people say, well, how can I do that? I'm glad you asked. There ain't no special way. There ain't no magic wand. There ain't no magic potion. There ain't no shortcut. Listen to me right here. Our potency is directly proportional to your daily contact with God. Your potency is directly proportional to your daily contact with God. It's like I love that things on Facebook said, don't tell me God ain't speaking when you ain't opened your Bible. Guys, you just got to be in his word. And I've told you before, there's a great, you know, some of you, I mean, for, for this is the fourth or fifth year now in a row, I use what's called the Bible in one year app. It's by a guy named Nicky Gumbel. Um, and it is phenomenal. You go through the Bible in a year, and Nikki does a devotional about each of the, you, you get a, a psalm, you get a, a New Testament reading, an Old Testament reading. And somehow, through his Holy Spirit genius, he ties all three of those together. And you get a great devotional, you get a great reading, it's on your phone, it'll even read it to you, which is pretty cool because the Bible was meant to be read aloud. And that's one of the things I love to do is have it read to me and I follow along in my, my hard copy Bible. But it's called the Bible in One Year 2020. Get it on your app store. It's great. Some of you know who Bear Grylls is, the guy that does all the outdoor stuff. This bear, bear's a devout Christian and that's what he uses every day. 
Um, and I heard Bear Grylls mention, I thought, well, shoot, if it's good enough for him that eats snake heads and, you know, water buffalo dung, I, I can probably, you know, I could probably use it myself. So it's been great. That, I promise you it's awesome. So high potency, when you get that potency, it keeps you right on the edge of infecting people with, with, with the love of Christ. And you do it lovingly and tenderly. You know, you don't beat people on the head with a Bible, you know, as big as a Sears Roebuck cap. Turn it, burn, go to hell. You know, it's Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus. Now, now obviously, there, you know, you do get to a point where you have to say, now there, you know, here's some things that we need to think about. Okay, but you do it with love and tenderness, and you you tune yourself into a heart to. to for, and allow the Holy Spirit to let you sense that receptivity. You know? High potency keeps, keeps us tapped in to the Spirit of God. And it keeps us tapped in to that flavor that we need to bring to the earth. Guys, Jesus is saying, Christians, you need to flavor the earth. You need to flavor the earth. But also, not only do we need to have high potency, we've got to have close proximity. That means we've got to be where he put us. Okay? We've got to, we've got to be where he put us. And, and we've, got to be, we've got to be around people. Okay? Now, here's the thing. As a Christ follower, you should be in the world, but the world shouldn't be in you. You know, and this is a sad fact, but I, I was with some guys the other day and, and, and I'm not judging people. I'm just telling you, this guy told me, he said, I, I don't even have, I don't even know anybody. And this, this is a pastor. <laughs> he said, I don't even know anybody that's not a Christ follower. Yeah, that's what he said. He said, I don't even know anybody that's not a Christ follower. He said, I don't, I don't even know where you go to hang. I don't, I don't even know where you go to hang out with people who are lost. I said, dude, follow me. <laughs> you know? I mean, guys, you see what I'm saying? If we, this, that, that pastor was so full of, that pastor was so full of potency, but he had zero proximity. He was loaded to the gills with knowledge and all this stuff, but he had no proximity around people. Why are you going to sneeze Jesus on somebody that's already infected with Jesus? And we need to be careful about that. And we need to be careful. I'm not saying just go out there and act like, because if you're acting like the world, you are becoming like the world. But you can be in the world. You know, the problem with this is a, a, a boat is meant to be in the water, right? The problem comes when the water gets in the boat. Okay? So, you're supposed to be out there. You're supposed to be out there. So, you've got to be out there so that your chicken will taste good. Well, it's here, hon. I mean, you know. Don't have to eat all of them. That's what she does to me at home. Okay, all right, I, I got you. Listen, this is a fairly good example of, a, of a, the majority of believers. We can be really potent. We can go to church every Sunday. We can go on every mission trip that's out there. We can go to every small group. We can do all these things. We can watch 72 things on TV and hear everything on the radio. But we ain't about to get out where people need to hear it. Yeah, Nathan. When you put salt on stuff, you're attractive. The chicken's sitting there, and you thinking about it. Oh. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of times we are afraid that if we get out there, we're going to get ridiculed. Or no, it's you actually are attractive. Great point, Nathan. Thank you. And by the way, those of you who are guests, this is the way we roll around here. We talk to each other. I hope that's okay with you. You know. Um, I talked to a guy one time after he left. He said, dude, I'm not used to people talking to the pastor in the middle of the sermon. I said, well, you better get used to it because that's what we do right here. Would you repeat 
Uh, okay. Um, right, right. If you didn't hear that online, online, Nathan said that a lot of that the salt makes us attractive, and it makes not in ourselves, but it makes it draws people to us in Christ. Okay, it makes us attractive. People say, "I want what you got. I want what you got." Um, and um, well, I won't go into that story. It's too long. But you need to you need to do that, and we need to teach our children. How to be salt and light in a dark and hope and tasteless world. Okay, we do. You know, my children are all musicians, and I had them all read uh, this book called Roaring Lambs, which if you're a musician or if you're a technical person or a theater person, you need to read that. Roaring Lambs is great because it says God is calling us to be roaring, to be lambs, but to be roaring lambs in the entertainment industry. And, and that you can show people in Hollywood and in the music industry. You don't, have to, you don't have to be miserable and down. And you don't have to produce an album that sounds like it was made in somebody's basement. Which, quite frankly, a lot of Christian music sounds like. I'm just telling you. It's got good words. But, but if you're listening to production value, it's terrible. That shouldn't be, guys. As Christians, we should have the best. Hollywood and, and all the studios should be looking to us for how we do things. Not the other way around. But anyway, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother series. Okay? So, we've got to be, it, it makes us attractive. And, and it's people who, who, you know, as I was saying a while ago, unfortunately, we have gotten to a point in church where, where we have lots of potency, we walk a God-honoring path in our lives, but we never get out where we can sneeze Jesus on people. We just don't do that. We're, we're very good-looking table ornaments, but we're terrible infectors. Okay? You've got to have close proximity to, to people if you're going to infect them. You've got to be around people like that. Um, and that means that you've got to be intentional. You can't just hope it's going to happen. You know, I know a lot of guys that play golf so they can be around, you know, lost people. And I'm a terrible golfer. So I'd be, I, that wouldn't help me at all. Okay? But if you do that, that's great. I know one guy that, that plays every week in a different foursome. And, he, and the foursomes are all people that, that are not churchgoers or, or not Christ followers. And you better believe he sneezes Jesus on them. You know, instead of cussing that ball, he thanks Jesus for that ball, even when it goes in the water. You know? So, and whatever that may be for you. You know, for me, it's playing in a band and riding motorcycles and hanging out and camping and backpacking stuff. That's my way of being around people that are, you know, I want to get outside these walls. You know? So we've got to have contact. We've got to be intentional. We have to be intentional about putting ourselves in places where we can sneeze Jesus on people. Now, that doesn't mean you've got to be stupid and take a bunch of risk and stuff. Okay? But what that means is that you have to be intentional. And let me say this, too. Please understand this. And, and you all know me well enough, I think, to understand what I'm going to say. You don't pick a lost person to be a project. That person is not a project, like you're going to put another notch in your gun belt, on your gun handle, you know? That person is somebody who Jesus loves and died for. Amen. That's why you share with them. Don't come at me tell me how many people you didn't want to Jesus today. I don't want to know that. That's between you and Jesus. But I want you to be there doing it, Okay? So, that means we got to have, if we're going to start this epidemic of the gospel of grace, we've got to have close contact with people. We've got to develop some, some uh, intentional relationships with people. That's what that whole who's your one thing that we did a while back, I hope you still got that. That's what that was for, to, to encourage you to intentionally focus on one person and just begin to pray for that one person. And then pray for those gospel conversations we'll talk about in a minute. So, which leads me to my very next point. Sneezes, evangelistic sneezes are big, they're wet, and they are loud. Infectious sneezes are meant to be heard. Remember last week I told you about my mom's sneeze? We heard it over a block away. It's crazy. It was loud. 
My mama cleaned this room out right now. I mean, not with what come out of her, what come out of her vocal cords, not with out of her nose. She, uh, this room, you, you have to put your hand over your ears. Okay? But look at the second metaphor Jesus used here. And it has to do with this being loud. He says in, in verse 13, You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand and gives it gives its light for all who are in the house. Now, notice that says all who are in the house. So if you light that light, it shines on the Christ followers and the non-Christ followers, right? Yeah. All right. So, just like salt makes a difference in people's food and my chicken, light makes a difference in their surroundings. All right, their surround light illuminates. Let me show you what Jesus is talking about here. Y'all, uh, flip the lights off for me. Those guys that were going to get those for me, do that. <coughs> Jesus says, "You are the light of the world." Okay, and that light just shined on Julian and and all you y'all down here. It did. Okay, now, but he says nobody lights a light and then puts it under a basket. Sneaking out there. Okay? That don't make sense, does it? See, all y'all went back in the dark except from what's on the screen there. Jesus says, this, don't, this is not the way it works in evangelism. Now, is the light still on under there? Okay. So, see, that's you and me. We got the light of Jesus, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Pray God, glory, hallelujah. But don't ask me to shine it in front of nobody else. I'll shine it in church all day long. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. But don't ask me to shine it at Walmart. Jesus didn't give you an option. He said, shine the light. Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. You are the light of people's worlds. That's how their light gets turned on is by seeing you. And I say, you can't see this, but right now, that one lamp right there is illuminating all those faces. I, uh, all the way back to Eddie and Jill back there, y'all can't even see it, but that light is on your face back there. That's what Jesus is saying, guys. That's from one light. Thank you. From one light. From one light. Amen. One light. And in we can go ahead and flip those back on. Thank y'all for doing that. What we need to do is we as Christ followers, Jesus is saying, you let me shine in you and through you. And we're going to make a difference. Okay? We're going to make a difference. And what that means is this. When you, sh when you are shining that light, you are clearly showing people what Jesus is like. And some of you are going to lose me right here and you're going to get mad at me. But that means you got to open your mouth. I'm around people all the time say, you know, I witness for Jesus every day and never open my mouth. And I'm thinking, well, that's great. But what happens How's that person going to understand? How's that person going to know what the gospel is if you don't say something? Guys, listen. you got to say something. Now, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong. You know, we, we try to live Jesus around people and be Jesus to people. But you've got to be ready when the time comes to speak something with your mouth. A lot of you are going, oh, Lord, he done gone blow it up now. Mm, he done asked me to say something. You know, I was good with that now. I was good at going playing golf with lost people and all that, but oh, don't damn me say something. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Guys, listen. The gospel itself literally means the verbal proclamation of victory. The verbal proclamation of victory. The gospel literally is, is comes from a from a Hebrew term where in the old days, like if a if a reigning king would would defeat another kingdom. Then, then the army leaders in that the, the uh, kingdom that won would send a runner back to the king to tell him of victory. You know what that runner was called? The evangelist. See, you thought it was all about you and Jesus. No. 
because that evangelist is telling the good news of victory. That's why they, Paul used the word gospel. He said, guys, we got the good news of victory. We need to be sharing. We got the good news of victory. And how would you think if the runner ran all the way back from, you know, that's why they call that marathon, you know, whatever, because that runner ran 26 point something miles back to the king. How would you think if he ran up to the king and went, and king's like, come on, what? give me the news, give me the news. He's going, give me the news, man, give me the news. You can be near him, but if you can't go speak it, it's not, and, and please understand, It's not the good news of victory if you can't speak it to where the other person understands the good news of victory. Too many of us are like that evangelist. We run up to the king, whoever that may be, and we're like, well, dude, I'm here. I'm right next to you. I'll even rub your shoulder. And, and, and those hopeless people around us are going, tell me the news, tell me the news, tell me the news. And you go, oh, I'll just, I'll just sort of be nice and, and all that stuff beside you. Folks, you've got to be ready to tell people the news. You've got to be ready. Words, verbal proclamation. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. You don't have to be super eloquent. Exactly. You don't have to be super eloquent. You know, I had a guy tell me, I, you know, I don't know how to do this. I, I said, look, you're speaking right now. You just speak. Well, the Holy Spirit will give you the words that He wants. Exactly. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you those words. Too many times we shut the Holy Spirit out of this thing. Make it all about us. Listen, and here's a freeing thing. For those of you in sales, I hope you'll understand this. You ain't got to close the deal. You just show the product. And the product sells itself. You know? Exactly, Beck. We've got to pray for ourselves. It, direction. You know, we've got to be clear. We've got to be concise. That's why we've done several things here over, over the past uh, year. We did um, the three circles, the three circles thing. Remember? That's, the, that's one of the best ways for you to share the gospel with somebody in a non-threatening environment is just using the three circles. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, and, we, and we try to, get, you know, the who's your one uh, ministry, all those things. We try to equip you to do that. But here's the thing. Now listen, and you, you might want to write this down on your notes. I don't know. But you, here's, what you, here's what you need to verbally be able to say. Four things. Okay? One is God's nature. Okay? God is love and He loves you. Second is that other person's sinfulness. But your sin separates you from God. Okay. Third is Jesus' payment, but God made a way for you to come back to Him and to be reconciled through Jesus' death on the cross. God has forgiven all your sins through Jesus' death on the cross. And then the fourth thing is how you catch the virus. In other words, what do you have to do? Would you say this prayer? Y'all, I, I do it with you guys pretty much every service. If, if this is you, you might want to say a prayer like this. Okay. And you just lead them in a prayer and tell them, say it from your heart. Say it from your heart. I had the sweetest time with one of the kids in the, in the elementary class. Um, and I was saying a prayer. I said, now just say it from your heart like you're just talking to Jesus. Guys, I'm telling you, I didn't want to get up from that table. I would say something and that little, that little child would turn it into their language and was the sweetest. Oh, I wish I had had some way to record it because it was just beautiful. It's just beautiful. And going along with what Debbie said in, in Romans 10, 14, Paul says, how can they believe in somebody who they haven't heard and how are they going to hear if somebody don't tell them? You know? So Jesus said, we've got to clearly communicate that message. We've got to do it. Uh, uh, Greg Steyer, a uh, good friend, says it like this in his book. He says, it's great to, and this is him talking, if you disagree, you can call him. Uh, it's great to live out the message that you believe that is vitally important but if you don't share the gospel with your words then you're not sharing the gospel at all. And I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying that you don't 
you know, live, uh, live in front of people. But there's a time where you, you know, where you, you live Jesus in front of them. And then when the, when the Holy Spirit opens that door, you've got to be able to know what to say. Right, right, exactly. Don't be afraid of pushback because, you know, and, and again, don't take it personally. You know, too many times we take this personally, oh, they're rejecting me. No, they're not rejecting you. You know, they're not rejecting you because you ain't the Savior. All right? So, a light is meant to be seen. That means that, that we need to be distinctive. We need to be seen. Uh, but that doesn't mean we need to be seen, you know, like, look at me, look at me, look at me. And a light is for guiding other people. Listen. Think about this with me. You and I as Christ followers are the lamps. We are not the light. Amen. And when you start to think you're the light, then you done stepped over the bounds. We are the lamp. All we're asking to do is just for Jesus to shine through us. Through us. Okay? And just let his light out. Okay? Let his light out. So, we're going to wrap up now. And the, the, uh, Justin and a couple of the team are going to come up. And I'm going to move my chicken out of the way. I'm getting your chicken. Thank you. Honey, would you share with them about um, what happened at the school the other day? Barbara shared with us about those boys that she has come here. Yeah, with. yeah. But it, this, it, to me, is the, the best example of building relationships and letting your light shine and then go into these young young guys over at Great, Holly. great. Thank you, hon. We, as you know, we have a great partnership with Mount Holly Elementary School. We love Mount Holly Elementary School. We've been there six years. Going on, We're in our seventh year now. And we're there all the time. If people, every day there's people from Outbreak Church there. And we do stuff like the birthday table. We do um, reading buddies. We do all kinds of different things there. But you know what? The, the end result of reading buddies and birthday table is not only so that those kids can feel you know, special on their birthday. It's so we can live Jesus in front of them. And Barbara was telling us the other day that she sat down with three of the young boys that she's been building a relationship with now over three and a half, four years. And they began to talk with her about God and Jesus. And she was able to share Christ with them right there at the, at the table in the cafeteria. You know, a year before last, we had an after-school program called Quest, where we had um, where, where we had some young boys once a week after school. We'd been there uh, 26, well, th at this time, 13 weeks. And we, and we were just there being Jesus in front of them, doing life with them. And in one afternoon, sitting around in, in one of the classrooms, we brought in pizza and we were just having a sort of a roundtable discussion. One of them said, Pastor Scott, can you tell me what it means to be a Christian? Three boys accepted Christ that afternoon in that classroom. You know? And, and I, we're not bragging on ourselves. I'm bragging on God. I want you to see the impact you're having at a school, you know. The other day, before the principal went into her surgery, the, the, the entire... Uh, faculty was called into the cafeteria some of the uh, district office people were there and they called and asked me to come and the reason, they, the reason I found out later they called me to be there was they said we want you to pray over our principal so right there in that, in that school several of us laid hands on the principal and we prayed over her and we had church right there and so what I'm saying is guys listen that's what it means. You got you know, we can live Jesus in front of these kids all our lives, but when those kids ask questions or when those kids we've got to be prepared. We've got to be prepared. Okay? And so thank you for reminding me of that, hon. That's a great, great, great thing. Two thousand years ago, Jesus sat up on a hill and told people about what it meant to be a Christ follower and how to be contagious. And I want you to look at your your hand out there just a second, your note page. Bill Hybels, in his book, uh, Contagious Christian, Becoming C Contagious Christian, says it like this. It's a formula. And please understand, this is some of you right now are thinking, well, a formula, that automatically takes the Holy Spirit out. No, it doesn't. Okay? Okay? Look what it says. Bill Hybels puts it this way. 
HP high potency plus close proximity plus clear communication equals maximum impact. And that's what we want to have is max, maximum impact. Okay? We've got to be potent enough, we've got to be close enough, and then we've got to have clear communication for maximum impact. All right? Don't try to fool with the math. Some of you right now are trying to think of, you know, how to, how to get around, just like I did in, in math in school. How, how can I get around this formula? No, you just work the formula and watch Jesus work. Watch Jesus work. Wherever there's high flavor, close interaction, straightforward dialogue about the truth, and the Holy Spirit is active, there is a contagious Christian virus that is infecting someone that matters deeply to God. And when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world, he meant you and me. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for teaching us through your word, Lord. Thank you that you've called us the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Lord, help us to, to have that, to, to, to get the right flavor, the Jesus flavor in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then help us to be close to people to where we can sneeze on them. And then help us to have the the words to say when they ask, why are you so different? Why are you so different? And right now there's people in this room who just might need to say, I, I, I've never met this Jesus guy. Well, today can be your day. All you have to do is say, Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I can't make it on my own. God, I believe that you came to this earth, that you made a way for me to come back to you through your son Jesus, through his life, his birth, his death, his resurrection. That he, for, that he made a way for my sins to be forgiven and cleared my eternity for you. And God, I confess now that I want you in my life and I want to put you in the driver's seat of my life. If that's you, if you said those and meant them from the bottom of your heart, you are now infected with the gospel virus. Others of us might just want to say, you know what? I've spent my whole life trying to get potent, but I've been scared to be proximity. Or you might say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm potent and I'm in proximity, but I'm just afraid to say anything. Whatever God's telling you to do, you do that today. Every person's got a next step they can take to move one step closer to who, who and where God wants them to be. I pray my prayer is that you would have the courage to take that step today. In Jesus' name. If you need prayer over anything, you're welcome to come up here. We've got prayer team members around that would love to pray with you. Whatever God's telling you to do, you do that as we sing. You can sit. You can stand. You can do whatever you want to do as you do business with God right now.